We've talked about the good and bad information that's out there, and that information is changing rapidly. So we've asked Dr. Alan Morrison, an infectious disease doctor, and a hospital epidemiologist, who is also a consultant for Fairfax County Fire and Rescue, to speak with us. And interestingly, he was directly involved with the Ebola Rustin event in 1989. Dr. Morrison, thank you for being here. Let's start out by, give us a little history on the Ebola virus. Ebola virus was named after the Ebola River in Zaire and was first identified in 1976. During that initial outbreak, there were over 200 individuals who were infected with over a 50% mortality rate. Thereafter, the following year, over 300 people became infected with an 80 plus percent mortality. Additionally, one small outbreak in the continental United States occurred in Reston, Virginia, in a primate facility where several people seroconverted, but there were no fatalities. It was felt at that time that the Ebola Reston strain was less virulent for humans compared to Ebola Zaire. Finally, there was a single case of an ethologist who was doing a necropsy, an autopsy, on a dead chimpanzee, and that case occurred in the Côte d'Ivoire. So now we have a current outbreak that's been described, and the details of that are coming in piece by piece. The current distribution of Ebola has been seen in Africa, Western Africa, predominantly three countries. In an important paper just published in the New England Journal of Medicine this week, the current data suggests that as of the middle of September of this year, approximately 4,500 cases, including those that are probable and those that are definite, have been identified. The case fatality rate is in excess of 70%. The incubation period, which is no different than Ebola viral disease cases in the past, has been tacked at approximately 11 and a half days. In fact, calculating local doubling times in Africa and putting into effect what we do know about transmission and modes of transmission, unfortunately, the estimate is that by the first week of November of this year, there may be 20,000 cases of human Ebola disease in Africa. That's interesting facts. You talk about the mortality rate. We've received a number of questions and comments regarding the number of influenza deaths that occur across the country every year. How does this Ebola virus compare to influenza? Put it in context for us. Influenza virus, highly contagious, airborne spread, obviously very different in that we have a very effective vaccine strategy, does result in several hundred thousand admissions per year to U.S. hospitals. The death rate certainly is plentiful. Airborne diseases such as influenza, tuberculosis, SARS, with which we have familiarity with an outbreak, and even Neisseria meningitidis, the classic meningococcal infection, as airborne spread viruses and bacteria, the infectivity would be viewed as very high. To date, the caseload with Ebola virus is very low, but the mortality rate is exceedingly high. However, there does not appear to be any incidence or event that suggests a change in the transmissibility of Ebola virus. In other words, contact spread only, and there does not appear to be any evidence for airborne transmission. So the key takeaway here is a much higher mortality rate in spite of the different mode of transmission. Let me ask you this. If we transport a patient that's suspected to have the Ebola virus, what is the testing process for that patient? And how soon would our member who transported this patient know if that patient was in fact infected with the Ebola virus? As with any occupational exposure, whether it be HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, as an example, the, the ability to identify rapidly the source patient as either positive or negative is a crucial element of the algorithm. At this point, there are very limited laboratory facilities who are able to perform acute testing on a potential source patient. Although those laboratory facilities do exist, the experience of our colleagues in Atlanta recently 
and portrayed by Dr. Ribner and his colleagues have led us to understand some of the operational issues that are attendant to this. What I mean by that is simple. For instance, having a laboratory contractor that will take a specimen to a facility where testing can be done seems very straightforward. In Atlanta, however, they discovered that their contractors, the courier services, refused to take and transport this blood specimen. That would be a hindrance. Therefore, the reliability of prompt diagnosis has some italics associated with it at this time. I'm confident that those things can be worked out, but at this point, there are some bumps in the road, and the, the ability to rapidly secure a diagnosis may be hindered by factors that we don't normally see in other occupational exposure events. Which is why we see the long quarantine or isolation period that happens when there is a suspected exposure. That's part of it. The 21-day isolation period is done partly to get information, but with an approximately 11 and a half day incubation cycle inherent with this virus, you want to go at least two incubation cycles, approximately 21 days, to make sure that infection doesn't exist by virtue of symptoms emerging slightly beyond the known incubation period. So yes, there's, an, there's a practical feature to this and a biologic feature that leads to that quarantining cycle. So what does this mean for protection for our members? We know inherently that emergency response is a high-risk activity. Everybody looking at this information understands that fully. You're in an uncontrolled circumstance where you have very little knowledge and you need to be maximally protected. The mortality with this virus in human disease is extraordinary relative to most things with which we deal on a regular basis. The updated guidance from the Centers for Disease Control this month, October of 2014, have outlined additional measures commensurate with the information that we have as follows. First, a face shield would be important, not because of airborne spread concerns, but because the end stage and active infection with this virus often leads with patients presenting with aggressive projectile vomiting, copious diarrhea. And this is blood laden. And the reason is the mechanism of the virus infection. People die in disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. They bleed out of all orifices in a very ugly way. The opportunity to come into contact with direct blood from, for instance, projectile vomiting is a reason for the shield. Goggles alone or goggles and a mask do not protect skin. Specifically, the updated CDC guidance says no exposed skin. So a face shield with a high garb up to the neck area. Recommendations currently including double gloves and potentially even taping the double gloves at the interface of the sleeve, the long sleeve, in case the glove or the sleeve would ride up or ride down respectively. So significant coverage of all exposed skin areas with a face shield that affords protection against direct exposure to skin. We must remember this is a contact spread virus, but the clinical features of the virus when infecting a person can act a little bit differently than a lot of contact spread. As you know, the information that's being disseminated out there is changing daily. Thank you for joining us and sharing this critical information with our members. It's a pleasure.